Hi, right, welcome to Meteorology101.com. In this video, I'm going to cover warming of the Earth and the atmosphere. So if you like these videos, please like, share, subscribe, and visit Meteorology101.com and get your head in the clouds. Okay, warming of the Earth and the atmosphere. Energy from the sun, sun rays come in, they are not evenly distribute, distributed over the Earth. The shape of the Earth is a sphere, so when the sun comes in, hits the sphere, it scatters out, stronger at the equator, more direct hit at the equator, and then hits at an angle at the mid-latitudes, and then at even more uh, slope at the upper, the higher latitudes. So that's why it's colder in the north, colder in the south pole hotter at the equator so at any given time half of the earth's surface receives solar radiation half of it is absorbed or reflected back out to space so the incoming solar radiation from the sun is scattered through the atmosphere depending on how saturated or dry the atmosphere is and that determines the solar radiation that will be reflected back out to space or absorbed by and used to modify the air mass it enters so the energy imbal imbalance is what drives weather. So if you have a cold air mass, sun coming in, there's no moisture. Um, it, it's not going to heat that air mass a whole lot, but that's the surface. It's like on a clear day, say you have high pressure coming through. Say a big high pressure comes out of Canada, pushes to the south into the United States. It's a cold, dry air mass, and that the sun beats through. You have no clouds, so it's a cold day, but it feels better in the sun. You're feeling the heat rays of the sun. So now, depending on what the ground is like, grass, if there's snow on the ground already, or you know if the grass is, if its ground is wet, if it's sand, depending on where you're at, if that energy is either absorbed, reflected back, you know, then that will modify. Dependent, depending on that, will modify that air mass. So high pressure modified from the surface. So you'll get into a high pressure system. Subsidence, just cold air pushing down keeping the clouds at bay keeping clear skies but you can still get you'll see it still see if uh the earth is radiating pretty strongly from that energy then you can still get fair weather cumulus clouds and still have a fairly cloudy day it'll be partly cloudy most of the time because it's just fair weather cube um, which is a convective cloud so you can have convection in a high pressure system, chances of rain are slim to none. Temperature, temperature just refers to how hot or cold something is. Another way to think of temperature is the kinetic energy, the energy of motion. The faster something moves, the more energy it has, the higher temperature, the hotter it is. So slower speeds, less energy to lower the temperature. So temperature is basically the average speed of the air molecules or the average kinetic energy. So Think of the molecules like uh, everything has molecules, and these molecules are always moving unless they reach a temperature of zero degree Kelvin, which is absolute zero. All molecular activity comes to a stop. So anything that has moving molecules is emitting radiation, so it has a temperature. So the example... Most books use over and over again is in an air-filled balloon. So if you fill a balloon with air, the molecules, the temperature is pretty much the same as inside as it is outside. If you heat that air inside, then the molecules start moving faster, become warmer. They move apart, and actually the balloon will expand, and then the density of that balloon decreases, so then that will cause that balloon to rise. So... The air inside the balloon, if it's cooled, then the molecules decrease in movement. And then they crowd together, the balloon shrinks, becomes more dense, and the balloon falls. If the air is continually cooled, the speed of the air molecules decrease. So eventually the molecules will stop coming, stop moving, right? That's what we talked about some minutes ago was absolute zero. If you keep cooling those molecules, they slow down, slow down, slow down until they come to a complete stop. 
that is when the Kelvin scale absolute zero all molecular activity comes to a stop that's absolute zero temperature scales we use basically three temperature scales Fahrenheit Celsius or centigrade um, we covered that in the last video Celsius uh, developed a Celsius scale named it centigrade that's why you can call it Celsius or centigrade and then the Kelvin scale and I have the temperatures listed uh, the freezing levels boiling points those are the temperatures I have another scale on the next page uh, scales just start and end at different numbers it's the only way to look at that to convert Fahrenheit to Celsius or Celsius to Fahrenheit then to go from Fahrenheit to Celsius you would minus 32 degrees and then divide that by 1.8 if you wanted to convert it to from Celsius to Fahrenheit then you'll multiply the Celsius temperature by 1.8 and then add 32 there are the three temperature scales uh, different temperatures for how what what how that affects water the water boils at a certain temperature freezes and then you have absolute zero which is no motion in the molecular at the molecular level at all okay latent heat <clears throat> latent heat is energy required to change a substance like water from one state to another <clears throat> so either heat is given out or heat is taken in so on this scale we look at a vapor liquid and solid three states of the three there's three phases i guess phase change or change of state whatever you want to call it um so for a vapor to goes to a liquid it would so in the if you think of it as in the atmosphere standpoint the weather standpoint you say um an air parcel the ground heats up so incoming solar radiation the sun hits the earth some of that's absorbed the earth emits radiation so that creates an upward motion say like a heat thermal a heat low and then that would cause an air partial to rise when that air partial rises it cools cools to the dew point and once the temperature and the dew point become basically within five degrees of each other then that's when you get uh this one is the condensates so cools to the dew point condensates the gas becomes a liquid so now that you now that creates a water droplet one water droplet in a cloud which there are billions and then you have all that happens all at once and then you can actually get to where to the point where you have enough water drops to be able to see the cloud now what level that happens depends on the the construction of the atmosphere so if you take a scoo t chart um i believe we covered some of that in the last video a radio sound that's released every 12 hours the national weather service releases those radio sounds they send back temperatures dew points and then you can see the basically a cross section of the atmosphere and that will determine at what level based on convection you have a convective condensation level if an air partial was raised just by heat alone at what level would that condensate you to create a cloud level so if there's a lifting condensation level that if the wind was to blow across the mountains the air was forced up at what level would that air partial be cooled to the dew point and becomes condensated to create a cloud level there so there are you know many tools to use just to uh judge what level the clouds are going to be at based on lift and moisture so condensation and then when that air partial once it becomes a cloud condensate you can see a cloud you get an air partial and then that moves up above the freezing level then you temperatures drop and then that water will freeze so now you got the gas that went from gas to a liquid the liquid to a solid and then just reverse the order an ice crystal falls hits a warmer layer temperature increases melts it becomes a liquid and then comes down to the drier level and either one it evaporates before before it hits the ground that's your evaporation or it falls as a raindrop so 
the other two steps is to go from gas to a solid and that would be a deposition I, I think of deposition as leaving deposits behind the gas just basically it condensates on something but it skips that level of the liquid and it just freezes right there on the surface so if you think of like an old freezer that has an an ice box they call it you know then um that metal liner that cold air if it had any moisture if you put food in there it have it causes it having that food that air moisture would evaporate and then get into the cold air which cold air doesn't hold moisture so that air would hit the surface of that cold metal and then it would just freeze on contact and that would leave a like a basically like a it was called a rime ice it would be just air porous uh opaque ice that build up in the freezer and then every so often you had to defrost the freezer um sublimation is the opposite where the solid goes straight to a gas and the best example of that would be like dry ice if uh, ice is a solid and then that ice is just evaporating right into the air and you get that fog that comes off of dry ice that is sublimation so the difference be between these phases is is it releasing heat or is it taking in heat so the latent heat of evaporation the heat energy used to change a liquid to a vapor is evaporation it means evaporation is a cooling process so if you're sweating you got the you start to sweat you get the water on your skin it condensates evaporates makes you cooler the latent heat of condensation is actually a warming process so if you think of like a take a can of soda cold can of soda put it in the sun and then it starts to condensate that is actually starting to warm the different wavelengths um just listed them here basically the best example of that is one one millionth of a meter um that is the uh, infrared waves the um shorter the wavelength just more energy that's the main thing to remember out of this so like the sun has a pretty strong radiation if uh, we didn't have the atmosphere then we would have you know basically just be burned by that radiation um, depending on how much moisture is in the air uh, the construction of an air mass what you know how much of that radiation is absorbed by the atmosphere before it reaches the earth or reaches us and then if you want to get a suntan you're absorbing a lot of radiation so you're starting to cook basically um that's getting hotter and hotter and then uh how much is reflected back you know out to the atmosphere how much it hits the bottom of the clouds how much it actually makes it back out to space so you think of the greenhouse effect where you know, incoming solar radiation hits the earth the earth heats up radiates out and then either hits the clouds stays warmer in the lower levels keeps us warmer at night or escapes up into the atmosphere or out to space and then that keep that's colder at night so um heat transfer the three ways to transfer heat in the atmosphere is convection like i said uh incoming solar radiation hits the uh it's the earth the earth absorbs depending on you know if it's sent if the ground is sand grass you know uh, dirt if it's rough smooth it's water um, how much of that is reflected back how much of that is you know absorbed and then if you get a lot of reflection back say the earth absorbs that radiation gets hotter then you have a heat low a thermal um, then you can have that can create a rise and then once you hit your convective condensation level where the clouds where the air partial cools to the dew point and then the clouds form the condensates clouds form and then you, that's when you get your convection so you have heat rising so when you have the heat rising the cold air has to sink and then replace that warm air so then that's when you get you know the rough edges around the clouds that's why the clouds aren't just perfectly smooth around conduction is 
Okay, incoming solar radiation hits the Earth. The Earth absorbs that radiation, emits some of it back out, and then that heat from the the radiation being emitted from the Earth hits the air that's coming in contact with the Earth, and that's touching that, and that is that heats that air mass. So that's conduction. Now, the other way to think of condu conduction is put a uh, put a pan on a electric stove when it's sitting on that hot burner. That's conduction. That's a transfer of heat by conduction. Advection is the Earth is emitting that radiation, and then the wind comes by, blows that over, and then you get warm air advection, uh, cold air advection. You know, advection is the movement, horizontal movement of that heat or cold air. All right, radiation. The definition of radiation is transfer of energy through electromagnetic waves. Electromagnetic waves have both electrical and magnetic properties. That's hence the name. Uh, travel through space and the atmosphere, 3,000 kilometers, 186,000 miles per second. The speed of light. Radiation is described in terms of wavelength. So measured from crest to crest. So just the, like I said, the amount of radiation Measure for crest to crest, that's going to be your wavelength. Let me get to the next slide here. So measure from crest to crest, there's your wavelength. The, the shorter the wavelength, the stronger the radiation. That's the main thing to take out of this. So if something has a strong radiation, short wavelength, it's pulsing fast as it can, then that can burn you. That's the hotter it gets, the more energy it has. Um, you look at a uh, weather radar. I mean, it is emitting a waveform, a wave uh, wavelength, and then depending on how much of that is reflected back from the atmosphere, then that's what shows us that picture on radar. So if you have snow, high reflectivity, rain, ice. Um, different levels, what ways, you know, then it can measure the speeds on those, those air partials where it's moving. And, you know, basically radar measures like speed. It's like, it can, it can estimate the speed, but it can, it mostly for direction, it's either, it either sees it coming into the radar or leaving the radar. But when the radar emits a wavelength out, um, it measures that wavelength coming back based after it's reflected back. So. There is a the Doppler dilemma where if you increase the outgoing wavelength, make it stronger, it can't go as far. If you make it, if you want to get the distance, then it takes longer to get back, and then you can't have the, the best of both worlds, a fast uh, wavelength with a fast return. Now, the return is basically the, you know, different, with that wavelength bit, bounces off something, from the radar and then returns back to the radar if it's closer the faster it's going to return but you can't have the best of the fastest wavelength and the distance I guess that's what I'm trying to say you either have the distance or you have a stronger wavelength and you, then you can whip that radar around and get a faster reading process that data faster get a faster picture on the radar but that's just getting a little off topic there Okay, radiation, the uh, unit of measurement for radiation is the micrometer or the micron. So the best examples of this is one one millionth of a meter. That's how small the wavelength is. If you look at that uh, 10 to the negative 6, um, that one is infrared waves. So the smaller the wavelengths, the more the energy we covered that. And that's measured in micrometers. And we'll cover a little bit more of that here in a minute. Next right here we got. Basically, the ultraviolet, visible, infrared, millimeter, and a microwave. So a couple things I want to cover here is just, one, the visible colors. If you look at the visible wavelengths, you know, 0.4 to 0.74 micrometers. That is what we can see. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, when you get on violet, that's the rainbow so we could have those visible colors based on those wavelengths. Anything outside of that, 
typically we cannot see. Now, to get up to the microwave radiation, one centimeter to ten centimeters, that's I just think of that as a microwave. Yeah, the microwave sends out a radiation, radiates that that wave, and then hits those molecules in your food, basically in the water that's in your food, and then those molecules move faster and faster and heat they heat up and that warms your food. So if you have a a food product that doesn't have a lot of water and you put it in the microwave, it doesn't really get too hot. The bowl will get hot or you know, like some microwave safe bowls they don't you know, they don't if they're not microwave safe, I guess they get hot. They absorb that energy instead of the food itself. So yeah, that's the difference is basically if, if anything that has water will those molecules will move a lot easier and faster to heat up the food. All right, uh, conduction. So transfer of heat from molecule to molecule. Like I said, if you remember the putting the pan on the electric stove, that's one example. The other example is uh, heating a needle with a flame. Hold on to a needle, take a lighter, heat it up. It's going to hit your finger and it's going to burn. So that's conduction. The, the molecule to molecule is traveling through that through that needle. Um, plumbers uh, they know better than to grab the pipe if they're heating a pipe up to sweat one in for uh, plumbing. You know they're not going to grab that pipe because they know that pipe gets hot. You know, further away from that burn, you know the longer they keep it on there, keep that flame on that pipe. In the atmosphere, air being heated by a hot blacktop molecules. Coming into contact with the surface, get heated. So that's the conduction. And then air being a poor conductor of heat, unlike metal. That's why insulating materials have lots of air pockets. So you go out and you buy insulation. That's why it's real puffy. Because um, that's a real bad conductor of heat. So the heat will just dissipate between those in those air pockets. So that keeps it keeps your house insulated. Keep the cool air in, hot air out, either or vice versa. All right, convection this is where we talk about the cloud development, um, the transfer of heat by the mass movement of fluid. So if you heat the ground, it rises, then the cold air has to sink back down and then replace that warm air. And let's see, we usually reference convection to vertical motions and it happens every day in the summer hot air or air over hot surfaces like blacktop or sand is heated by conduction we already covered that I don't know why I got that there um, so convection warm air rises the cold air sinks and then once that when that cold air starts to sink it kind of just rolls down and the, the convection when the heat the hot air rises up it rolls up so you know, it's not just a smooth transition there, and that's why your clouds aren't just perfectly round. So you have the cold air sinking in, you know, warm air, pu you know, pushing that out, or I would have to say cold air more or less pushing the hot air in, because cold air is always going to rule. It's more dense. So when the cold air drops down, it pushes in the clouds, creates that subsidence, and then dissipates the outside edges of those clouds. But the heat low the thermal is too strong so it keeps rising in the middle so the cold air can't push it out it just creates that pressure and then then you just you end up with the cloud you know once it hits that condensation level those air partials are cooled to the dew point it condensates and then keeps pushing up and then just rolling rolling around to get those rough edges around the clouds so warm air causing to expand, become less dense, like the, we talked about was with the uh, with the balloon. Heat that air, it expands. The air, the balloon does get a little bit bigger, and then becomes less dense as the molecules spread out, and then becomes less dense than the air, and that will cause it to rise. So density of the air, if you think about um, altitude density, if you go up, you know the less dense it is because there's less molecules above you as you go up in the atmosphere then you would have to create uh, a lot less dense atmosphere inside your balloon to raise to rise out up and you know into the upper atmospheres but probably with the energy and the spreading out probably wouldn't get too hard 
to do that as your hot air balloon rises. All right, thermals. <clears throat> Rising volumes of air. So instead of being in a hot air balloon, it's just a it's just the air itself. Warm air rises as a thermal, cold air sinks to replace it. We talked about that in the couple pictures ago there. Uh, if you, if it cools to the condensation level and creates the cloud, then you can see it around the cloud being a rough area. If you look at the picture in the background here, you can see that is a towering cumulus, uh, you know, hot air rising up in the middle, cold air sinking on the outside edges, and then that would either cause you know, that cause that air to to dissipate those uh, water particles to dissipate and then create that roughness around the cloud and then it's you know it's clear on the outside at the outsides of the cat of the cloud so if you look at uh basically the times of hot surface at 2 p.m 2 15 rises even higher and then you know 2 30 then the air that air particle just break off and then rise now um i guess the way to think of that is on a scoot chart you can find your level of free convection so if you have a convective a convective layer that the, the ground heats up rises up expands that air the air shoots up into that cloud and then once it reaches a certain level then there's nothing stopping it to bring it back down to keep it suppressed it, it's just an unstable layer and then the level of free convection it just continues to build and then that you'll get an air mass thunderstorm that can just build all the way to the tropopause all right uh, development of a thermal, also called convection, convective circulation, or convective cell. So we talked about that. Cotton ball clouds, um, that's the roughness around the edge of the clouds. You know, your fair weather cumulus. Um, cumulus is a convective cloud. So that's mostly what you'll see from this. And then depending on how much moisture is available, uh, how strong the lift is, um, just be, being based just off of a thermal low itself or a thermal that you know, it gets so hot that if it can create a thermal low to bring that moisture into the upper atmosphere, hit that level of free convection and continue to build, or is there another stable layer above that going to suppress it? And then, you know, all you ever get is just some fair weather, weather cumulus, maybe some towering Q, uh, you know, just um, suppresses it to never really reach its potential into those stages of a thunderstorm to develop. Advection, like I said, advection, look, think of that as the horizontal movement of the air mass or temperature. Um, so uh, if you look at on a surface chart, say cold air advection, if you have thermal advection, you know, if a, a cold front, high pressure, winds from the north behind the front, winds from the southwest ahead of the front, um, bringing that you're wrapping that temperature, pushing the temperature. Once you're changing temperature, blowing colder air into warmer, warmer air into cold, that's the temperature. You know, that's your advection, thermal advection. So, um, let's see. Reserve the thermal convection for vertical air motion. We already covered that. Talk about heat transfer due to horizontal air motions. We use the term advection. So, convection is vertical, advection is horizontal. Air transfer of air, the transfer of air properties by the wind, fronts, cool air blowing off the water, etc. So, um, a sea breeze. Uh, land heats and cools five times faster than water. So, in Florida, if you think about it this way, uh, Florida is just a peninsula, heats up, and then the air comes rushing in from the water, the cooler air, and then that creates a sea breeze. Now, if you get a strong enough thermal right down the center of Florida, you can get that heat, that convection. Um, say the heat, the lift, because Florida's closer to the equator, so it's hotter. So you get that stronger lift down the center of Florida. Sea breezes come in from both the west and the east coast of Florida, and if they actually are strong enough to hit, uh, converge in the center, you'll get that line of thunderstorms right down the center of Florida. So that's caused by ad advection. Now here's a heat transfer graphic radiation. Sun puts out the radi energy, uh, radiation, electromagnetic radiation. And conduction, the heat transfer from one substance to another. And convection is a heat transfer 
transfer of heat, energy, and a in a fluid. So then you get the heat transfer from the you know through the clouds. Warm air rises. All right, three important facts about radiation. One, all things emit radiation. Sun, earth, trees, you, me, everything. Unless it is cold, cooled to the temperature of zero degrees Kelvin, then that's when all molecular activity comes to a stop and nothing is happening. So if you look at this, uh, these trees radiate radiating energy. So... Say the sun was out, uh, heating up, the, the trees would heat up faster than that snow. The snow would be reflecting that radiation back. The trees would be absorbing it. Then they would be emitting that more radiation, and then that would help melt that snow around those trees. All right, the wavelengths at which an object emits depends primarily on the object's temperature. So we said higher temperature, shorter the wavelengths, more energy. Lower the temperature, lower the wave, longer the wavelengths, less energy. And then the equation to measure the maximum wavelength that's all here. Um, basically, the hotter objects emit shorter wavelengths. So that's the main thing to get out of that. Okay, number three. Objects with higher temperatures emit radiation at a greater rate or intensity. We pretty much covered that. So how does this relate to the atmosphere? Primarily concerned with radiation emitted from the sun and the earth. It's roughly in balance. So... Let's go back over here. Energy balance. Here we go. Uh, just as all objects emit radiation, they also absorb radiation. Um, different differential between the emission and absorption is what determines the heating and the cooling. So if you're, you know, the emission is great. If you're emitting energy more energy than you abs are absorbing, then you're cooling off. If you're absorbing more than you're emitting, then you're warming up. So as objects absorb radiation, they heat up. Like I said, if you're emitting more then you're absorbing your cooling. At night, the emission of radiation from the Earth is greater than absorption of radiation from the sun. You have none coming in at night. So you have no radiation coming in at night because the sun's on the other side of the Earth being blocked. You're not having any coming in, so it's all it's all cooling. Um, now, how much it cools depends on the moisture in the atmosphere. If there's clouds or cloud cover, that's where we talked about before the greenhouse effect. So we'll get a little bit more detail into that. Some objects absorb better than others, depending on if they're, you know, black top, a black car, a good absorber, snow, if it's a poor absor absorber. Um, perfect absorber emitters are called black bodies. That means they basically um, emit as much radiation as they absorb. Objects that absorb emit better at certain wavelengths are called selective absorbers. So if you got an object that's emitting, always emits emits more radiation than it can absorb, then it's just a selective absorber. So or if it can absorb more than it can emit, or vice versa. So Earth's atmosphere is not a black body. Water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, ozone. Nitrous oxide behave differently with the absorption and, and emission. So that's why it all depends on where you are. If you're at the equator, in the mid latitudes, uh, what type of background you have. Um, if you think of an infrared, uh, you know, temperature, your temperature versus the temperature of the background that you're that you're on. If the camera's looking at you, if it can see you or not. You know, stuff like that. If you're emitting more uh, radiation than your background, then you'll stick out on certain wavelengths. So the atmosphere is, you know, it's got cloud cover. Then the sun comes in, hits a cloud, reflects back. We'll cover that here in a minute too. Let's see. Greenhouse effect. The gases in the trop troposphere, CO2, water vapor mostly um, strongly absorb most of the long wave radiation emit, emitted from the earth's surface these substances then re-emit a long wave radiation in all directions including back toward the ground so there's a graphic incoming solar radiation bounces off the earth you know the earth absorbs that emits it how much is being absorbed how much is being emitted then 
if what it hits when it go tries to escape back out to, to space. Either it's escaping back out to space if there's no clouds, or it's hitting the clouds and then bouncing back down to Earth, and that's keeping the, the Earth warmer at night. But most heat is contained within the atmosphere. That's on the greenhouse effect. If you have clouds, then it's mostly it's contained. You have more more of that energy being contained within the atmosphere than it's escaping back out to space. And that's the, so that's the greenhouse effect. Without the greenhouse effect during the day, all incoming solar radiation from the sun would get into our atmosphere and it would cause very hot days. So you'd be running the air conditioning every day. At night, all of that energy, solar radiation, would escape back into space and the temperature would drop and you'd have to turn the heat on at night. Incoming solar radiation, once the radiation from the sun enters our atmosphere, a few things happen. So it's either absorbed by gases, absorbed by the Earth's surface, scattered by the gases and aerosols, reflected by clouds, and the Earth's surface. So if you have snow on the surface, you reflect it back. If you have sand on the surface, then it could be absorbed or reflected back off the sand or, you know, depending on how much of that is an absorber or an emitter, whatever background it is. All right, scattering, deflection of radiation due to striking of small particles. Energy goes in all directions. When that incoming solar radiation hits an object, say just even a water droplet in a cloud, it scatters in all directions. So it has to do a lot with the size of the particles compared to the wavelength of radiation. So like, uh, I'm thinking of this on a, ra on a radar standpoint. So the radar shoots out, hits an object. What does that object do? Either it reflects that in all different directions, it sends it back to the radar. How much of it's getting back to the radar? What's the intensity of it? Um, you know, if it's an aircraft, say a stealth, you know, the stealth was designed to absorb that that wavelength when they, that radar sh shoots out. Then the panels on the stealth aircraft are made to absorb that, so none of it gets back to the radar, so it can't see be seen on the radar. I mean, is it 100% efficient? You know, not really, but uh, pretty efficient for, you know, they got it down to a science, I would say. So, um, particles in the atmosphere are just uh, the right size to scatter visible light. So, now there's two types of scattering, Rayleigh scattering and my scattering. Um, Rayleigh scattering is the one we're most familiar with. It's what makes the skies look blue. It's responsible for blue skies. So, scattering the light by particles in a medium without the change in the wavelength. And then my scattering, scattering of an electromagnetic plane wave by homogeneous sphere. So basically, you're when if you have a something that's a sphere, uh, the incoming solar radiation, radiation hits it, and it scatters evenly. Why are the clouds white? Droplets are large and scatter all visible wavelengths equally. Why is the sky blue? The air molecules scatter shorter wavelengths the best. There's more scatters blue more efficiently than other colors so why not green violet blue wavelengths are emitted at a greater intensity and eyes are more sensitive to black to blue than they are green red sunsets uh light travels further through the atmosphere shorter wavelengths scattered before light gets to your eyes it's on a shorter wavelength and then red skies are more because there's more dust particles in the atmosphere so there's more dust in the atmosphere then it changes the whole way the the light comes in and scatters throughout the atmosphere and it can make it look red there's a picture i took uh, it's a uh, sunrise so when that sun came up and it hits that it hits the uh, the atmosphere at a certain angle then you get that red tint and say uh Red in the morning, sailor warning. Uh, so, but that's not always true. All right, reflection influenced by the clouds, snow, water, angle of the sun. Um, radiation comes in, hits an object, depending on its albedo, how much of that gets reflected back. Presented radiation returns from the Earth's surface compared to that which it strikes. So, which strikes it. So, if the radiation comes in, it hits the Earth. How much of that's getting reflected back versus how much it is being is it's absorbing if that object that determines the albedo of that object so and that depends mostly on the sun's angle and the surface characteristics what's it made of is it rough is it smooth is it you know um snow reflects well of course fresh smooth snow at 4 p.m is a higher albedo than dirty rough snow at noon so you can 
pretty much how much is it reflecting back. That's the measure that you're looking for. Right. Overall, albedo, albedo of the Earth is 0.3. So 30% of all radiation striking the Earth, the atmosphere, the atmosphere system is reflected back to space. Snow, clouds, vegetation, sand, and water. Um, pretty much self-explanatory there, uh, but I guess the important thing is 30% of the radiation striking the Earth is returned back to space. And then everything else either hits the clouds, comes back in. Um, I guess you, you look at it as a, on a global scale, you know, for that 30%, when say, um, you know, 30% all the time, but your 30% is, you know, at any given time, you know, typically 30% of that the strikes the Earth is reflected back into space. So the water, you know, we're mostly water, so a lot of that's being reflected back. Um, back to the greenhouse. Let's see. Some radiation is absorbed by the atmosphere and re-emitted in all directions, and the atmosphere radiates some. The rest makes it through the top of the atmosphere and is emitted to outer space. Also, latent heat, sensible heat, are transferred from the surface to the atmosphere. So you got the heat and comes in, the Earth absorbs it, emits it. Um, some of it escapes back to space, some of it hits uh, the clouds, reflected back to Earth. You know, then the Earth emits more, hits the clouds, come back down, that's the greenhouse effect. And then some of it, you know, doesn't hit the clouds and is emitted back out into space. So. Now here's a balance. Uh, graph it's just uh, incoming solar radiation versus how much is it absorbed by the surface uh, creating these thermals that's emitted back into the atmosphere and then are there any clouds formed when those thermals form uh, how much evaporation transpiration um, if you go get the convection thunderstorm build up you know that's going to affect you know, all of a sudden now you got a big thunderstorm of cumulonimbus above you, uh, heavy uh, condensation, and then that's just the, that energy is just pushed right back up into that cloud and none of it escapes. You know, so this is just your balance of how much is energy is coming in versus how much is coming out, and then look at all of the different things that can affect that. So, like I said, last the last slide was space. You know, thirty percent of the Earth, you know, the incoming solar radiation escapes back out to space. So, the other seventy percent is, you know, pretty much absorbed in the clouds, absorbed by the Earth, uh, creates the clouds. You know, causes that um, cloud formation, and then is absorbed even more. You know, reflected back to the Earth, the greenhouse effect. You know. Like I said, there's a lot taking place. All right, seasons. Solar energy input varies daily and annually. Seasons are due to getting more solar radiation at different times of the year. So the sun's angle, the tilt of the earth. You know, why do we get more, more at certain times, distance from the sun, tilt of the earth, or both? You know, the tilt of the earth. So the tilt of the earth is basically, you know, it is the distance from the sun that changes the distance from the sun. So the way the sun angle hits the earth. So that's going to be, you know, the number one answer there is the tilt. Um, so that tilt of the earth is what causes the seasons. We'll go through that here. So in the nor northern hemisphere, so in the wintertime, the earth's on an axis 23 and a half degrees, tilted back uh, away from the sun. The northern hemisphere is tilted back away from the sun, and then that causes the winters in the northern hemisphere, summers in the southern, southern hemisphere. So two things are caused by the tilt of the Earth, change of the angle, which the sun strikes the surface, and the number of daylight hours. Um, this graph here is basically what, you know, basically the southern hemisphere versus norm, northern hemisphere. So in December, uh, summer is in the south of the equator, winter is north of the equator. So you can go down a list if you want, um, change of the seasons based on the tilt of the Earth. I think we covered that graphic. So the summer solstice, June 21st. The northern hemisphere is tilted toward the sun, so it is warmer. All right, southern hemisphere seasons are opposite of the northern hemisphere. Christmas is during the summertime. 
temperatures don't fluctuate as much between seasons. More water south in the southern hemisphere than there's the north. The northern hemisphere has 61% water. The southern hemisphere is 81%. Water doesn't heat up or cool down as quickly as land. Land heats and cools five times faster on water. So I guess the, with the sea breezes, um, the land heats up. Then that colder air over the oceans come rushing in. That creates a sea breeze. And then at night, it cools down. Then it, the land cools down. That creates a colder air mass that creates a little bit higher pressure and then that will push on cause a land breeze going in the opposite direction at night so like i said if you like what you see like uh these videos please like share subscribe that's the way i keep these videos coming um if you have any questions put them in the comments uh try to keep these things basic and won't try to get too deep into stuff so just uh let me know what you think and thanks for watching